ship of death. Watching you for the first time, turn to prepare your boat, my mother. Making it clear you have other business now, the business of your future. I was washed through with anger. It was a first survey, an eye thrown over sails, oars, timbers. As many a time I'd seen that practised eye scan a laden table. How can you plan going off like this? When we stand at last close enough, if the wind is right, to hear what the other is saying. I never thought you'd do this, turning away mid-sentence, your hand testing a rope, your ear tuned to the small thunder of the curling wave on the edge of the great night sea, neither regretful nor afraid, anxious only for the tide. May for Marion. The blessed stretch and ease of it, heart seas, the hills blue, all the flowering weeds bursting open, balm in the air, the bird song bouncing back out of the sky, the cattle laying down in the meadow forgetting to feed, the horses swishing their tails, the yellow flare of furs on the near hill, and the first cream splatters of blossom high on the thorns where the day rests longest. All hardship, hunger, treachery of winter forgotten, this unfounded conviction, forgiveness, hope. I always thought when my father died that the sky would fall, but it didn't. He died um, on Christmas Day some years ago and I wrote this poem in the, in the months immediately following it. After my father died, the sky didn't fall. It stayed up there, luminous, tattered with crows, all through January's short days, February's short days. Now the year creeps towards March, damp days, grass springing. The poplar's bare branches are fruited with starlings and thrushes. The world is the body of God, and we, you, me, him, the starlings and thrushes, we are all buried here, mouths made of clay, mouths filled with clay. We are all buried here, singing. I wrote this poem um, before avatars had crept into the language and its meaning had changed, has changed slightly. At the time when I wrote it, an avatar was generally understood to be to be something small enough for our for our minds to to get round the idea of God. It was a sort of representation of God. Um, so it could be anything from a stone by the side of the road to a little altar in your home to something some symbol of nature in which you saw God. Avatars. This is the trinity, he said, tramping the wet road to the thin well-being of a winter morning. God the curlew, God the eider, God the cheese on toast. To his right, a huddle of small blue mountains squatted together discussing the recent storm. To his left, the sea washed. I thought it was whimsical what he said, I condemned it as fay. Then I saw that he meant it, that unlike me he had no quarrel with himself, could see his own glory, was young enough for faith still in flesh and in being. He was not attracted by awe or high cold cleanness, but imagined a God as intimate as the trickles of blood and juice that coursed about inside him, a god he could eat or warm his hands on, a low god for winter, belly weighted with the unmistakable call of the bog curlew or the sea going eider. This next poem is, is about, um, it was written in the Pyrenees, I had a residency in a beautiful place in 
the Catalan Pyrenees and the only other thing I really need to say about it is that I've been ill for many years. Flesh. Sitting in a doorway in October sunlight, eating peppers, onions, tomatoes, stale bread sodden with olive oil, and the air high and clean, and the red taste of tomatoes, and the sharp bite of onions, and the peppers scarlet crunch. The body coming awake again, thinking maybe there's more to life than sickness, than the body's craving for oblivion, than the hunger of the spirit to be gone. And maybe the body belongs in the world, maybe it knows a thing or two, maybe it's even possible to once more remember sweetness, absence of pain. This next poem was written on All Souls Day, as opposed to All Saints Day. It follows All Souls follows All Saints. It was written for two old men who lived down the road from me and who, whose house I had the privilege of visiting. One of them had died the year before. Where I live in Kilkenny, it's a very ancient landscape and it's very rural and it's always, it's a scattering of of farms which is called the townland and there is a strong sense particularly at this time of the year that that the spirits of all those people who have always lived here are around us sewing you can feel the dead crowding in the fierce low sun they've kept their distance Light fade and they flock like small brown moths. The dark and fall and crawl and rise and settle, cloaking my shoulders with their soft drab wings. The great saints have their high appointed ritual. This is a congregation of the parish dead, local to these scattered fields and farms. A friend of mine rang me up, her name is Liv, and she asked me if I'd like to go to the local sheep fair with her to buy some, some sheep. I should explain at this point that in Ireland we call a ewe a yo, so she wants to buy some yos. But though she keeps yos, she wouldn't trust her judgment completely on them, she's better on cattle. So she asked her neighbour Finton to come with her, because even though he keeps cattle, he's really into sheep and that's his, his expertise. I had been I had been reading some of the Sufi philosophers and I was very struck by their emphasis on the the, the fact that we are the, the eyes through which God sees his world. And I also then and I, it, that this had been reinforced because I've been reading the um, French socialist philosopher, mystic Simone Weil, and I found a quote which starts the poem which says almost the same thing as these 12th century Sufis had been saying. Sheep fair day. The real aim is not to see God in all things, it is that God through us should see the things that we see. Simone Weil. I took God with me to the sheep fair. I said, look, there's Liv sitting on the wall waiting. These are pens, these are sheep. This is their ship they are walking in. This is their fear. See that man over there, stepping along the low walls between pens, eyes always watching, mouth always talking. He is the auctioneer. There is wind in the ash trees above us. There is sun splashing us with running light and dark. Those men by the rails with their faces sealed, they are buying or selling. Beyond in the ring, where the beasts pour in, huddle and rush, the hobbits are auctioned in lots. And that woman, ruddy faced and home cut hair, a new child on her breast, that is how it is to be a woman, milk running, sitting on the wooden boards with animals and knock and death 
as the bidding rises and falls. Then I went back outside and found Fintan. I showed God his hand as he sat on the rails, how he let it trail down and his fingers played in the curly back of a yo. Fintan's a sheep man, he's deep into sheep, though it's cattle, cattle that earn him a living. Feel that, I said. Feel with my heart the force in that hand that's twining her wool as he talks. Then I went with Fintan and lived to refreshments. I let God sip tea, boiling hot from a cup. And I lent God my fingers to feel how they burned when I tripped on a stone and it slopped. This is hurt, I said. There'll be more. And the morning wore on and the sun climbed. And God felt how it is when I stand too long, how the sickness rises, how the muscles burn. Then later on, at the back end of the afternoon, I went down to swim in the slide of Green River, working up under the bridge against the current. Then I showed how it is to turn onto your back, with the bob you and a long way up, two gossiping pigeons and a clump of valerian holding itself to the sky. I remarked on the stone arch as I drifted through it, how it's dappled with sun from the water, how the bridge hunkers down, crouching low in its tracks, and roars when the lorry drives over. And later again in the kitchen, tired out at day's ending and empty, I showed how it feels to undo yourself, to dissolve and grow age old, nameless, woman sweeping the floor, darkness growing. The title of this poem comes from the Robert Louis Stevenson poem. It's called The Hunter from Home from the Hill. Quiet by the window of the train, watching the blanching skies, the bleaching stubble, a breaking down of colour to something matte and porous and not at the heart of vision. Watching the winter lying down in the fields as a horse lies, bone following bone, the long ridge, the sheep, the blue note of the beet fields, the bungalows on rutted patches starting awake out of wild dreams in which they are gardens. Carlo, the ugly here and there of it, the damp stained houses, the sky over the beet plant, sausaged with fat round smoke. All as it is, like watching him in the kitchen in the morning, his vest, his thinning slept in hair, the way he is in your life, and you content that he be there. The next poem was written um, after I'd had a row with my husband and um, I'm, I, I, I take a long time to come back and he comes back much quicker but one of the ways that I used to come back is to go to the garden. It's called After Rage. After Rage. It was only when I had carried the seedlings out into the cold day, when I had sat myself down in the damp grass and pricked out hollyhocks, poppies, lavender, pinks, the young plants, the fibrous trail of their webby roots, firming them into their new places. Only then did I quiet enough for the great winds to die down in the white thorns of my being, for the magpies to leave off their rattling in the grace of the silver birch. <laughs> 